Oh, America isn't a democracy. America is, a, uh, is an oligarchy. It's a plutocracy. It's ruled by the rich. Of the rich, by the rich, and for the rich. Democracy in America is just a smokescreen. It's a charade that they perform every election cycle just to pacify you. Now, the United States has, for many years, taken pride in being called the land of the free. But is it really free? This is a question that I want us to explore today because I came across a clip here of one Arab who was speaking some truth about the American political system and how it has been designed to deceive the electorate into believing they are free, yet that freedom is not existing within that system. Let's watch this, then come back and talk about it more. Oh, America isn't a democracy. America is, a, uh, is an oligarchy. It's a plutocracy. It's ruled by the rich. Of the rich, by the rich, and for the rich. Democracy in America is just a smokescreen. It's a charade that they perform every election cycle just to pacify you. To make you believe that you have some stake in the system. But I mean, look at the reality. For roughly the first 100 years of American so-called democracy, only white male property owners could vote. The so-called land of the free uh, was built on the exclusion of the vast majority of its people from the democratic process. This gradually expanded to include all white males and then theoretically uh, black males, but not in practice, in theory. Eventually they had to grant the vote to women and Native Americans. Imagine that. The indigenous people of that land were the last to be given the right to vote in that land. What kind of democracy is that? But they never wanted power in the hands of the people. As the, as the franchise of voting expanded to include those who were not white male property owners, the real power moved further and further away from the democratic process. They dangled the right to vote in front of you to make you think that you're a participant in power. But they kept the real power in the hands of the wealthy elite, more and more so over the years. As the right to vote expanded, the relevance of the vote contracted. I said no one ever intended for power to be in the hands of the people, and it never has been. I mean, just look at how money controls politics in America today. The Supreme Court's decision on the uh, Citizens United case opened the floodgates for corporate money in elections. Billionaires and corporations pour millions and millions of dollars into political campaigns, drowning out the voices of ordinary people, of the whole electorate. They're hiring candidates. They're writing laws. They're purchasing policies that serve their interests. This isn't democracy. It's oligarchy. When a handful of wealthy individuals can dictate policy and sway elections, obviously democracy doesn't exist. Politicians just do a tour of duty in government to prove their loyalty to their funders before moving to highly paid positions in the private sector, working then for the same people that they worked for all along. You know, every time they do a tax cut, who benefits? The richest 1% will receive the lion's share of that, while the rest of the people have to make up the difference. Whatever they don't take from the rich, they take from you. Instead of taking from the 1% who own and control more, than, uh, more wealth than the rest of the 99%, they take it from you. And somehow you still think you live in a democracy. No. The democracy they have is the one they always intended to have, which is one in which only the rich and the owners of the society have any say. You have the right to free speech only because no one listens to you. And where has this led? Where has this system of yours led? Well, it's led to the only place that it ever could lead. It's led to the creation of an unaccountable oligarchical elite who don't see you as anything but entries in their accounting books either as assets that they own or liabilities that they need to eliminate. And through globalization, this nation within a nation, because that's all the rich are, just a nation within a nation, uh, they became a global nation. They became an empire. And America is just one of the territories under their sovereignty. Oh, they colonized you. America became a colonized country, conquered by their very own monopolistic plutocratic uh, elites. And they're subjugating you and the entire collective West the same way that you colonized and subjugated our countries. They've created global institutions, imperial institutions like BlackRock, like Vanguard, like State Street. That's why I talk about the owners and controllers uh, of global financialized capital. The owners organized institutions of control. And that's what BlackRock is. BlackRock is like the Ministry of Imperial Expansion. It's like the colonial office of the old British Empire. And we in the Global South, in the Muslim world, recognize it as such. Nobody likes BlackRock. Nobody likes the fact that we have to deal with this now, this predatory monster, this predatory monster that you made, that your system created, because you created the most insane wealth gap in history. 
and you created uh, financialized wealth, financialized wealth accumulation, you know, you brag about how brilliant your economy is, how your brilliant economy has created more billionaires than any other economy, as if that's a sign of economic health, not economic deformation. You know, you don't say that about anything else. For anything else, uh, such kind of a, a disproportion like that is seen as ugly and unnatural. Like if someone has abnormally large teeth or something, or like those guys who lift weights in the gym but only work upper body muscles, so they have little uh, spindly chicken legs. Your economy is a mutant. The point of a healthy economy is not to produce huge disparity, but you brag about it. Even as you hate BlackRock, while you made BlackRock, you created this class, you created this nation of parasitic wealth hoarders and the institutions they use to organize their economic power. The institutions of the feudal elite. The institutions that they use to consolidate and expand their control over everything. Well, nobody likes it, but you did it. You created this super predator, and now we all have to deal with it. And of course, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, it's not the first time you did something like this. The East India Company, the United Fruit Company, they were earlier versions of these types of institutions, these institutions of economic imperialism. And of course, for all of these institutions, the, the, the current ones and the previous ones, their main business has always been war and pillage. Because the fact is, you've never really come up with another way to make money. All your technology is only made possible uh, by vicious exploitation, slavery, and violence. You know, it bewilders me. Every argument that Westerners make to substantiate their claim uh, that their so-called civilization is superior, every argument is materialistic. We have nice things. We invented all the technology of the modern world and so on. You don't realize that when you make that argument to the global south, well, we're living in the background where all that technology comes from. It comes from our minerals, our rare earths, our mines, our ravaged environments, and our subjugated labor. We're living uh, in the part of the Apple logo where the bite is. So that doesn't impress anyone in Africa or Asia or Latin America. You have nice stuff. Yeah, we know how you got it. We know how you got it. And it wasn't by brilliance. It was by brutality. It was then and it is now. So you should really stop using that argument. It's self-incriminating. So we don't have the option. And we know we don't have the option to ignore BlackRock or pretend it doesn't exist. We have to deal with it. We have to deal with the reality of it. And the reality is... Uh, that those billionaires you uh, brag about creating have eaten you down to the bone. And now they're coming our way. They have completely captured your governments and all of the powers at the disposal of your governments. We can look around and see what's happening in the world. We can see what's happening in Europe, how BlackRock and the uh, World Economic Forum are humiliating and sabotaging that whole continent, weakening the countries of Europe while simultaneously driving them into war. Your inspirational billionaires are leading Europe to the slaughter. It's really quite remarkable. You know, they, they got rich by colonizing us, and now they're colonizing you. And if they can, they'll come back again and pillage us all over again. But we have experience now. Now we know better how to strategize and how to contain the threat uh, your uh, OCGFC posed to us. And we know how the power dynamics have changed in the world. That's why countries like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Malaysia are initiating deals with BlackRock, partnerships with BlackRock. We know the risk. Of course we do. But like I said, we can't safely ignore them either. By voluntarily giving them a stake in our economies, we disincentivize open hostility and aggression. And we can set the terms. We can define the relationship. And we can fix the limits to ensure, inshallah, mutual benefit. Look, there isn't a part of the Muslim world uh, that is not under threat. There isn't a part of the Muslim world today that they don't already have a prepared pretext for invasion and violent coercion from the Sahel to Southeast Asia and obviously the Middle East. All of the pretexts are there for violent disruption and destabilization. If it weren't for the partnerships between BlackRock and Saudi Arabia and the UAE and the Gulf and Malaysia and so on, I don't think uh, that there's any reason to believe that there wouldn't already be a region-wide war in West Asia, in the Middle East. But those deals have given the, the, the OCGFC a reason to prefer stability. It's those deals, in my opinion. It's because of those uh, strategic partnerships that Israel is getting more and more isolated. And it's why Zionism is fast becoming obsolete. There's no doubt in my mind that if our countries completely cut off access to institutions like BlackRock, if we completely shut them out, as many are inclined to do, and quite understandably, 
But I have no doubt that if we were to do that, then the neocons in Washington would have all the OCGFC backing they need uh, to launch multiple wars and campaigns of violence across the global south. Again, nobody likes it. And everyone is fully aware that these people are vicious predators and cannot be trusted. But it's precisely because they are this way that we have to deal with them. It's just like the mafia. Giving them a cut of your revenues uh, potentially keeps your shop from being burnt to the ground. Because you see, the OCGFC, your OCGFC, want to come over here, your Black Rocks and your Vanguards. I mean, for Vanguard, the name gives it away. They want to come over here, uh, but our systems are not like yours over there. I've talked about this many times. Our systems, our authority structures are not like yours. We have our own OCGFC. We have our own elites. We have our own domestic owners and controllers. Kings and sultans and emirs and tribal chiefs and muhtars and what have you. Especially in the richest countries, our richest countries, like the Gulf states. And they're connected. Those, those authority figures are connected, often even by family ties, to the population. They have a heritage of power and control, and they rule both the uh, public and the private sector. And they have a memory of colonization, and that memory informs their strategies now. Because they don't want to get co-opted again, they don't want to get subordinated again. They know your tricks, and they know your traps and your triggers, and they know your criminal intentions. And most importantly, uh, they know that you're coming over here, let's be honest, because there's nowhere left for you to go. And that means that they have some bargaining power, and that's what they're doing. Our liberation from colonization is not going to happen by means of some dramatic revolution, but by a careful, meticulous succession of maneuvers, just like a prison escape, moving at just the right moment, just the right distance. And once we get out of the prison compound, there's a minefield we have to navigate through. It's going to happen by a series of trade-offs with each trade-off resulting in more sovereignty and more independence than the last. And every door that we pass through will close behind us until eventually the prison guards and the prisoners have completely traded places. I believe that that's what our countries, the Muslim countries, the BRICS nations and so on, I believe that that's what they're doing. And they're doing it masterfully in my opinion. And there's no doubt that it's treacherous, it's dangerous. Again, just like a prison escape, it's dangerous. But I know from my own experience that solidarity and unity is absolutely essential. Everybody has a role to play. Everyone has to do their duty and everyone has to keep a cool head. This is not a drill. We're taking back our lands. We're taking back our territory politically, economically, psychologically, and culturally, and we're doing it methodically and systematically. And in my opinion, anyone who tries to incite emotion and incite impatience uh, is working for the enemy whether they know it or not. Look, look, our liberation will liberate everyone. And no one can do it but us. The West certainly can't do it. You created the problem. You gave birth to this monster. But we're your only hope of slaying it. And who do I mean by we? I mean the Muslims. Specifically the Muslims. The Muslims are the only ones who can stop this juggernaut. We have experience in toppling empires, but we do it our way, not your way. The Sasanians, the Byzantines, the Visigoths, uh, the kingdoms of North Africa, India, Central Asia, no one has confronted and transformed more empires than the Muslims, and we've never been conquered. Don't believe it for a second, that's a lie that the West likes to tell itself and tries to convince us about, but no, we've never been conquered. You never succeeded in turning our lands away from Islam, and you never will. And that's what our empire was always about. It wasn't like yours. It wasn't about colonization and wealth. We didn't have materialistic or power-hungry motives. All we wanted was for Islam to reach the people, and it did. And once it did, it stayed. The only way that you could turn a Muslim land away from Islam was by driving us out of it, which invariably resulted in a miserable orgy of violence and repression in any country that you drove us out of. But you never conquered a single land of ours uh, and successfully drove Islam out of it. Not even communist China and the Cultural Revolution could uproot Islam from the hearts of the Muslims. So yes, we have converted empire after empire and we can do it again with your monstrous empire of capital, your corporate colonizer empire, your OCGFC, your tyranny of elites. And we'll do it our way with tact, with dawah, with strategy, with trade and with negotiation. 
And if you have any sense at all, you'll be praying for our victory. Because Muslim victory over your psychopathic predatory 1% will free the whole world. And it's the only thing that can. You can thank us later. What a wonderful speech there. Do you really agree with this guy? Because for me, he's making a lot of sense. He has really highlighted some of the most important things here. And since United States is headed to an election towards the end of the year, I know there are a lot of truths that this guy is saying here that can really be mirrored to the current political campaigns that are going on. You find that lobbyists are always there for every political campaign and they are trying to sell themselves to a political side that they think could win. And this behavior has been pushed to almost every part of the world because even in Africa, like in Kenya where I come from, a lot of such deals are always happening. You find that a political campaign is going on, then there are those who want to cut deals with these politicians so that at the time when they get power, they are able to really sell their ideals and work in a way that favors them during their period in power. So this is something that is very true almost in every part of the world. And I think as a people, it is very important for citizens to understand who they are. You must understand the power that you have. You must understand your position within that country. You must also understand that it is you who gives these leaders their position. For example, if you look at taxation, you'd understand that taxation has always affected many middle class people. But if you look at the top 1% of the rich people across the world, they pay little tax to the governments. And this is something that it is very important for governments to really wake up and understand what they can do in such kind of circumstances. The only problem is that most of these governments are also controlled and owned by these elites. So all of us, wherever we are, I think we are all captured and we must play by the systems. But this is one thing that I want to say. We as a people must always understand that we can fight for our rights and we can stand up against every oppression that the governance structures are trying to put on us. So this solves one question. There is no black, there is no white American. All Americans suffer from micromanagement by the rich elites. It is just important that the little divisions that these elites try to create for us to fight over should really be solved so that we find ourselves having a better society. You understand one thing here, and I have always talked about it many times when I'm talking with my friends, the equation of political parties. We know that the major parties in America are Republicans and the Democrats, but these are just different sides of the same coin. When Democrats take power, the rich elites still continue to use them. When the Republicans also take power, the rich elites also continue to use them. So there is no one who is there fighting for you. It is only you who should come together as citizens of a country and ensure that the, that the governance system is working for the people. So let's wait and see how the elections will proceed and the outcomes, how they will be. But I think the American system, as our speaker has said, there is no freedom. It is not the land of the free. There is a lot that is really hidden behind certain veils that no one is able to open. So I don't know what to think about this. Please, if you're watching us for the first time, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like this video, and also share. Also remember to give us your opinion down in the comment section so that we may also understand your perspective of the issue. Thank you, and may the good Lord bless you. Goodbye. <laughs>